We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Chris Carlson. Chris Carlson is a writer, publisher, editor, community organizer, and executive director of the Multimedia History Project, Shaping San Francisco. For the last 25 years, his activities have focused on the underlying themes of horizontal communications, organic communities, and public space. He was one of the founders, editors, and frequent contributors to the groundbreaking San Francisco magazine Processed World. He also helped launch the monthly bike-ins known as Critical Mass that have spread to five continents and over 300 cities. He has edited four books, Bad Attitude, the Processed World Anthology, Reclaiming San Francisco, History, Politics, Culture, co-edited with James Brooke and Nancy J. Peters, Critical Mass, Bicycling's Defiant Celebration, and The Political Edge. He published his first novel, After the Deluge, in 2004, a story of post-economic San Francisco in the year 2157. And he is here to talk about his new book, Nowtopia, how pirate programmers, outlaw bicyclists, and vacant lot gardeners are inventing the future today. Start out and tell us, <clears throat> what was your motivation in writing Nowtopia? Well, Nautopia starts from some of the, those long list of things you just read off of what I've been doing all these years. And, and going back to the origins of Processed World, when we were in the financial district in the early 80s, a lot of us were essentially discards and rejects and, and graduates of uh, liberal arts educations. And what do you basically learn to do in college? You learn how to handle information. And so what, those of us that needed to find work after we had finished our time in the, in the schools were looking you know, what was available in the Bay Area, mostly in the downtown financial district, and we found ourselves handling information in banks and insurance companies and things like that. And it was a very empty experience, and we really weren't office workers or information handlers. We were philosophers or historians or dancers or photographers or gardeners or you name it, a whole bunch of different things, but that's where the money was, and that's how we got our bills paid. And so that starts this experience that really leads directly to Nautopia, which is that of a bifurcated life, a life in which a great deal of what you do is to take care of paying your bills is a job that you think is essentially worthless, or maybe you find it not so bad. Most of us try very hard to move on from the worst jobs to the better jobs and, and not find them so terribly onerous, and that's for, perfectly fine. But if you stop and think about it, most of what we do for jobs are kind of a waste of time. Most most of it shouldn't even be done at all. I mean, I think huge areas of the economy, as we call it, it's a strange fiction. It's just us going to work every day. Uh, the economy, you know, those activities are, are, are auto stop tomorrow. We'd be better off with banking, insurance, real estate, advertising, military production, the bad the production of bad commodities that break in six months or three weeks or however long it is. Uh, you think of even good jobs like teaching. Now they have all these teachers like essentially in assembly line factories churning kids out to pass tests and have very little to do with teaching them to think or to be fully human or engaged with the world, although many teachers fight that and are doing a wonderful job of continuing to, to you know, present a fully integrated education for the kids that are out there. So I salute the teachers. I just rec recognize that the system in which they're working is really constraining them. Similarly, in medicine, you know, you have doctors and nurses who are, you know, really committed to human well-being and health, and yet most of what they do is serve the needs of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. So there's a way in which our, our economy, if you will, has developed so that what we end up doing doesn't serve us. And I argue in my book, Nautopia, that it's at that point of sale when you're hired, you just lost control over the world. You're not any longer asked, should we do this? How should we do it? Who should we do it with? Why are we doing it? All the basic questions of work are left off the agenda in the United States. In a democratic society, quote unquote, uh, you would think there would be a rather intense discussion about what we do and why we do it. And how, does, how do we use what we do to get to the good life? But instead, we're in this society that has fetishized growth and has fetishized economic numbers as though they're some kind of natural phenomenon and they're either healthy or sick. And our rest of our lives suffer or, or rise based on these numbers, which are actually totally out of kilter to our lived experience anyway. And so we're in this kind of strange world where we want meaning, we want to reconnect to our own talents, our own ability to have artisanal relationships to our creativity, et cetera. And you're not going to get that in those most jobs. Over the last 30 to 40 years, and then going back even to the early part of the 20th century, most jobs have been made really stupid. Anybody can learn them. You can learn a job in an hour, or maybe a day, maybe a week outside. But that's about it. And most jobs, you just it's repetitive. It's designed to be that way so that anybody can do them. We human beings are the replaceable parts in the system. And it's very systematically set up that way for a very long time. So 
when you get uh, to the position where you're looking for work in society and you take a job that sounds like what you thought you were training yourself for and you find out it's this horrible, empty experience. It's very boring and very repetitive and leads nowhere and finally seems kind of pointless to do it in the first place. You're going to find your meaning elsewhere. You're going to find your engagement elsewhere. And now Topia is a book about how interesting it is that there is a sort of radical political and, and uh, work movements, if you will, precisely happening outside of wage labor. It's not about starting unions in your job and trying to, to get a, a little bit more money or a little bit better benefits. Of course, people do need to band together where they work and defend themselves from onerous conditions and low pay. But uh, what we see, the sort of agency, the sort of excitement, the energy that people have in life is really where they, they take it outside of work when they are not in the working class precisely. And I have a very broad definition of working class. Basically, all of us get up every day and go out and work and reproduce this world. And most of us have nothing to say about what it is we do or why we do it. That's the working class. There's a separation of execution from responsibility. It's a very broad understanding of it, much different than the <clears throat> innumerable sociological stratifications that people want to draw. I'm upper, lower, middle class. You know, I'm, uh, I'm over here. I'm over there. And, you know, really in our society, middle class has come to denote everybody between the person pushing a shopping cart down the street and the, and the fellow or gal riding in a Lear jet and everybody else is in the middle class. So it's a meaningless concept. And what that served was to divert our attention from what we do to what we own or what we can buy. And, what we, and our sense of political agency has been changed from what we do all day, our work, to what we do when we're not at work shopping. And that's really, you're supposed to shop well to change the world. And this is a big part of the political movements of the last 20, 30 years. It's like, oh, if you just make really good decisions as a consumer, you're doing your part. And my argument is that's totally false. You can buy anything you want. It doesn't make any difference at all. Capitalism determines what you can have. And we need to determine what we're doing as human beings. We should decide what's worth doing and how to do it. And we should create the world we want to live in. We could live a great life. Human beings could live really well all across the planet in a state of generalized abundance with enough of everything for everybody in a sense of, with a real strong sense of ecological sanity and biological coherence if that was the point of life, if we set ourselves as human beings to that end. But we don't. We accept all these ridiculous categories and, and fetishistic notions like money, markets, the health of the economy, as though these were something real. They're not real at all. We make them real because we get up and agree to this con game every day. But we could just agree to a totally different game and actually produce the world we want to live in. Of course, you can't jump from one to the other overnight. But we could start talking about it, and that's what this book is really an effort to do. So the examples in your book are people who are doing what they want, and they're doing so in a cooperative manner? Yeah, basically people are producing communities as much as they're producing interesting technological alternatives. And, you know, some of them are kind of, might seem kind of mundane at, at first glance. So, for instance, uh, vacant lot gardening is a big part of one big chapter in my book. Another one is what I call the outlaw bicycling subculture. Uh, there's also the free bio, the sustainable biofuels movement, which is, you know, the sort of the tinkerer's grail of seeking free fuel. Everybody wants that these days especially. Uh, the enormous amount of free labor that's gone into the internet and into telecommunications in terms of uh, open source and free software development and continues to this day. People have a great motivation to keep creating things that break out of the logic of the market. And all the, that area is interesting to emphasize because of how much it changes our imagination, especially, you know, here we are in the, the heart of a major high tech zone in Seattle area. And, uh, you know, all of us have something free on our computers, usually quite a few things that are free, whether music or software or what have you. And we understand that there's no reason to constrain it. There's generalized abundance. You can make eight, eight million, zillion, gazillion copies of anything, and it doesn't affect anybody who created it in the first place. So there's no reason not to see the world through this notion of collaborative labor, derivative efforts that base themselves on the shoulders, standing on the shoulders of the people that came before us and producing beautiful new things from the, all that cooperative effort, and then there's, it produces a world of abundance. That's a great metaphor for what the whole of life should be like. And so that's one of the things I like about the software movement. I can talk much more in detail about that if you like. But um, the gardening movement's an interesting one because it represents something of a reclaiming of the commons. And people went, you know, you go back uh, to World War II, I can back up even further, but I'll just start it there. You know, we had this big victory gardens movement in the United States instigated by the federal government because they wanted people to grow more food to help the war effort. And everybody, you know, for a great number of people, uh, that was how they could contribute was by growing food. And what, by the end of World War II, 45% of the fresh produce consumed by Americans was growing in urban gardens. So when we think about a kind of a systematic transition toward a more relocalized life 
in which we produce the things we need locally amongst ourselves and practical things like food and energy and transportation and communications is really what I'm talking about here. Uh, the food model of having, think of cities as urban food forests. They could be. We could actually probably top that 45% number if there was a, you know, kind of like a let's go to the moon type mentality about let's grow food in cities. Now, where, where would we do that? In just in vacant lots? I mean, that's where the movement starts is, is vacant, you know, People's Park in 1969 in Berkeley. One of the first things they do after they take this fence down from the, the university to put up around a lot is they plant a, a urban organic garden. And that influences people all across the country. And pretty soon you have people doing this in vacant lots all over the place. And it's not new knowledge. It's actually very often connecting to the elders in the community who had already had a great experience of learning about the local ecology, putting their hands in the soil, figuring out what would grow in the specific areas with the specific microclimates and soil conditions and water availability, et cetera. And that knowledge got transmitted across the generations in these gardens. And now you have, from the 70s onward, this proliferation of community gardens all over the major cities of the United States. And in the back in the East Coast especially, they were really the case where this, this working class that once existed had been broken down. This is an argument that I make when I present the book, and I didn't really lay it out yet here. But um, part of the frame of reference is this notion of class composition. So you have this working class that had existed that we all kind of remember. Oh, yeah, that's when people all worked in factories and went to this, lived in the same neighborhoods, and you had these kind of intact communities. Now we live this totally fragmented and atomized life in which everybody's moving all the time. Either moving from job to job or home to home, and there's not that sense of stability, and there's not that sense of knowing each other. And if you want to talk talk about sort of you know movements for for serious political change in our culture, you really need to have stable communities that know each other and trust each other, so they can envision it from below. It can't be something just imposed from on high. And so this uh, breakdown in the working class left a bunch of things behind, which was destroyed communities and urban life in the back east. There was these giant riots in the late '60s, and they burned down parts of the cities. And then the the landlords burned down other parts of the cities. And the city's uh, administrations in New York and Detroit and Philadelphia and places like that abandoned whole areas out of this sort of spatial deconcentration and, and you know, racism and, and other obvious factors. And so the people left behind, oftentimes, you know, women-centered communities slowly but surely start to rebuild their, their sense of community life. And one of the ways they did that was by invading these empty lots that had been abandoned that were full of needles and, and broken glass and cement and rubble and clearing them and realizing this is a great space for a garden, for, for a space for our kids to play, but we have to clear it out. So they would spend a lot of, you know, community would come together to do that. They would plant beautiful flowers and trees, and then they would start thinking they could grow food there. And people would meet there across generations and across ethnicities and across different musical tastes and all sorts of different things. And then you have these amazing thriving spaces. And they they really proliferated. You had over a thousand of them, in just in New York City and San Francisco, we have about 120. You know, there's uh, huge areas of Detroit now that are that are under the control of what's called the D Detroit Agricultural Network, and they're actually farming with tractors because there's so much empty land there. And Philadelphia has another, you know, 900 gardens and so on. And you can just find this story in every city. And in these gardens, then you have these new communities, and you have people actually thinking about food security and and really producing things for their own needs. And something really beautiful starts to happen with that. And then, unfortunately, there's the, the underside of this story, which is the, is private property, because finally these vacant lots are not common lands. They're actually owned by somebody, usually. Either the cities repossess them and are waiting for somebody to develop them into tax-producing re revenue uh, streams, or they're privately owned, and the private owners eventually come back and go, wow, thank you for starting this beautiful garden and bringing the neighborhood back from the brink. Now I can sell, sell this, or I can turn it into a you know a spot for, this is great, the neighborhood's gentrifying, my land's gone way up in value, thank you so much, I'll take it back now. And if you haven't you know taken the opportunity when it was worth nothing to really get ownership over it and, and actually end ownership over it, to, that is to say, put it into the public commons through either a, a land trust scenario or public ownership or something, well, you lose, and and that's what happened to a number of gardens. Although by by no means all of them, in New York City, a recent case in L.A. happened. A 300-acre garden down in L.A. across from a food bank was repossessed by the owner through some shenanigans with city council down there, and you know many families who were living off the food they were growing in this huge garden were um, dispossessed of it. So this happens again and again if we don't take seriously the underlying dynamic around the question of the commons, which is private property. Now, one of the things I like to emphasize is there's a huge amount of common land in every city that people don't really recognize it as such because it's covered in asphalt and it serves one basic purpose, which is to house private automobiles and occasionally move them. 
And that's an absurd use of public space, absolutely absurd. It's a really inefficient and poorly thought out use of, of, of urban infrastructure and urban space. So at least as a starting point, I think one of the, uh, our, our uh, next tasks is essentially to reassert some control over that common space and for other purposes than merely the, the shuttling around or parking forever of private automobiles. And instead, think of that as the starting point for urban food forests and what could we grow if we started shrinking streets to half their size. Maybe not every street, but you know, many of them could be shrunk a lot. And that new space opened up could be the place where people are, are growing food and planting fruit trees and or the free fruit in every city. I mean, I was in the city of Belém in the mouth of the Amazon once, and the whole city is full of these magnificent, gigantic mango trees, mangueras. And every day at 3 o'clock with the torrential equatorial rains, all these fresh mangoes fall into the streets. And, of course, there's a lot of starving people there, and these little boys who are completely homeless would just run around and grab up all the mangoes, and they'd have something to eat. And I think as we go forward in our society with the, all the obvious crises ahead of us, with water, fresh water issues, with arable soil issues, with uh, crashing availability of energy, et cetera, and I don't, I'm not a catastrophist. I don't think all this stuff's happening overnight, and I don't think it's going to happen all, you know, in a way that we can't ameliorate it and move forward in interesting ways together. Um, it seems like a pretty good idea to start taking some systematic action towards relocalizing food production as much as we could, including in cities. I wanted to get back to, you mentioned uh, software and the whole mm -hmm. uh, movement that's happening there. I was hoping you can expand on that because that seems to be an area that <laughs> the uh, corporate America is uh, challenging fairly uh, vigorously. Well, the open source and free software movements, you know, open source is already a, uh, essentially a co-optation of the notion of free software. And it was uh, created in order to create some legitimacy in the business world for using this different model of software. So the software world has evolved to a point where it's a little bit like a game of Texas Hold'em where there's five cards out on the table and everybody knows what they are. That's what all the open source software is. And then the business model says, great, you know, let's do more and more of that because it erodes the power of Microsoft or other companies that are tended towards monopolization and proprietary control over software. And so there's a, a move embraced by many, many smaller competitors who see that as a good strategy as a way of opening up markets and a way of getting more niches in them and so on. And so sure enough, that's happened and that a great deal of what's been produced in the last 15 years of open source has been paid for by corporations, as it turns out, because they saw that as their, that was useful to them. But the impetus for it in the first place and, the, and then a great number of people who continue to add on and augment what's out there for us as individuals are people who have these skills who refuse them to reduce themselves to being merely remunerated by money and see themselves as you know engaged in a larger process of really trying to open up the world towards this notion of free and and uh, creating a spaces in which people can do things without the constraints of corporate domination or you know the propagandistic systems we live in or the government telling us what we can do or not do etc and that kind of impulse has created incredible amounts of resources for all of us to then express ourselves. So lots of us have blogs now, and all of us are posting photos to Flickr and are involved in endless email chats and conversations and you know instant messaging, et cetera, et cetera, all of which has its origins in this kind of effort to create free space and open space. I mean, even the personal computer didn't come out of a corporate plan. It came out of a lot of tinkerers and garages thinking, you know what, there's no reason why we should leave giant corporations and the military to be the only ones having computers. Why don't we get some for the people? And I actually write about this in my chapter about the um, this group in Berkeley called the Community Memory Project, which I happened to work with back in 1979 and 1980. And they envisioned a great deal of what the, the the Internet has come to be in terms of what they thought they were creating. But they didn't believe at that point that there would be a personal computer in everybody's home. They thought that would never happen and that it would be creating these public computers where you could go and sit in a laundromat or a cafe and have access to everybody else and then anybody could make the news. This was really the vision was to change the media from being a couple of voices speaking to millions to being every voice speaking to every other voice. And really, the Internet has evolved in that direction in a really interesting way. So there's this kind of open space that's really interesting, and it's still obviously rushing towards a commercialized model and largely commercialized already. But there are a lot of openings and a lot of spaces there that remain inspiring. And one of the things that, happen is that happens is that a lot of the really talented programmers who are not satisfied with just reproducing prof profits for capital take their time and their energy outside of the market and produce really interesting uh, tools for social movements. So one example I have in the book is this guy, Guillermo Payet, who was a, a Peruvian programmer, came up to do a, a work for IBM and then worked for a dot-com startup that he, he had, and then it crashed like everything. 
And while he was doing that, he, in his spare time and with his people that he was working with, he, he kind of encouraged them to help, and they were happy to do it. They started something called localharvest.org, which you can check out. And it's a, it's a system that creates uh, that's a software tool for farmers, for small growers, and who are doing artisanal production and have old heirloom uh, strains of fruits and vegetables and things that, for which there's not a large market. And if they have to put it into the normal agribusiness model, they lose. Well, most farmers lose if they deal with agribusiness anyway. And so uh, he created a system whereby they could connect directly with with uh, people who are interested in what they're growing and their own their markets without any middleman. And it was totally free on his part to create this resource. And he did it because he cared about good food. He came from Peru and they had good food and he lived in Silicon Valley and they don't have good food. And he was really upset by that. And he wanted to figure out how could I get connected to the local food systems and make it so that they can sustain themselves. And in some ways, he's very parallel to the slow food movement, which in the United States takes the form of essentially wealthy people uh, indulging in foodie kind of politics uh, and events, spending lots of money on expensive things. But it has its origins in, in real working class efforts in, Ita in Italy, Italy and other parts of Europe to save the, the old ways of doing things, to save the old ways of making a certain sausage or a certain cheese or having this old arch orchard of pears that are totally heirloom that nobody remembers and, and bringing them back to life, but bringing them to the market. And it's kind of an iron irony for somebody like me who wants to overthrow markets and money to talk about these systems that essentially allow farmers to get money for their their very limited production of, of sort of glamorous small things, you know, whatever they might be. But it's the point being that we're living in a world that's cr that's really destroying the biodiversity, not of not only of the general ecology of the planet, but specifically of agriculture. There used to be hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of varieties of apples and pears and peaches and all these things, and now we're down to two or three or four, and that's very unsafe in the long term for the human human species and probably for the planet to to have reduced biodiversity that way. So this slow food movement understands that. To combat that, you actually have to create markets for these other these small heirloom vegetables and fruits because otherwise the farmers won't keep them going. So there's an interesting thing about sort of using the mechanisms in the short term as we move to a long-term society that's based on much greater diversity and much greater abundance. So what do you say to people to get them moving in this direction that are you know, basically bound by the current system? Well, yeah, that's a good question. We all do. We all are bound, right? I mean, you know, I have to pay, I have bills to pay. I have to earn some money somehow. And so we all find what we can do, the best compromise we can make. And my little mantra on that is better is better than worse. You know, try to find something that's better rather than the thing that's worse. Try to make a better decision rather than a worse decision about at every moment where you have a, a choice. And, you know, if you're caught up in a world in which you're working three jobs to get by, you probably don't have a whole lot of time to do anything else. If you're working in one job where you get enough money from it, you probably can take some time to do other things as well. And a lot of what we do nowadays is we help each other steal time from our jobs. Like if we're at a big corporation especially, there's a lot of space usually to get away with things, whether it's having time for chatting with your friends on the phone or on the computer or messing around on the Internet or more practically writing a book or you know creating new projects that you're working on in your spare time but then you can bring that into your work life as well so there's ways you can start to divert resources really importantly from the kind of things we do for money so there's all these little things you can do around that then there's also uh, the time when we're not at work which for many of us is you know different sizes of different availabilities and the different amounts of energy that we have left over after we've earned our money uh, but in those other spaces is where I think people have been really innovative and interesting. And it's precisely when they're not being paid and when they're not working class, not reproducing capitalism on its own terms, that they're inventing all these new ways of doing things. And so the gardening movement was one example. Another really good example is the bicycling movement. I mean, bicycling has just expanded like crazy since the early 90s. And one of the reasons was critical mass, which I was part of the group of people who started the first one back there in San Francisco. But um, that's not the whole story. Critical mass does create this amazing experience where you have hundreds, dozens, thousands of bicycles ro rolling through the streets together, reoccupying urban space, city streets for a completely different purpose in which people are talking to each other and they're hearing the bells tingling and they're having this different auditory experience. They're smelling the world differently. They're seeing the world differently. And they're talking to each other. I mean, how many places in the United States do people just talk to each other for the sheer joy of meeting somebody new and talking to them? It's almost always in a, in a bar or a restaurant or some version or another where you buy something to be there. And if you're not buying something, you have no purpose to be there. And so this life, our lives have been reduced to, to endless streams of commercial transactions. 
And Critical Mass was an example of people coming together on the bicycle with a different idea about public space and a different idea about what it is to be cohabitants of an urban environment. And so, you know, obviously some people don't like it and have their criticisms of it, and that's fine, and I'd be happy to talk about that with anybody. But for purposes of this discussion, the interesting thing about Critical Mass is it's kind of a launching pad. It's a place where people networked and met each other in this free space with a, with a new sense of what's possible about moving your body through the city, a new sense of how cities could be. And one of the most interesting things about all these initiatives in Nowtopia is how much it changes people's imaginations, how they think about what might be and what's possible. And so in the case of the bicycling movement, tons of women have been involved. There's all these bike zines going on. There's all these crazy cultural bike rides. I know just here yesterday in Seattle, you had a naked bike ride and people painted themselves quite beautifully. There, you know, all these, well, I saw quite a few people like that over the course of the day in this place that I was at. And uh, then finally, you have the rise of the what, what's known as the DIY bike shop. And, and DIY, we didn't, I'll just say a little bit behind that too. You know, the DIY bike shop is basically a place where you go with your bicycle and you say, you know, my bike's, I got a flat or my brakes are broken. Can you fix it? And they look at you like, no, we don't fix bikes here. Sorry. But but we'll show you how to fix your bike. And we, here's the tools and here's the, tri the stand and here's how you do it. And if you need me to stand next to you the whole time and help you do it, I'll do that. So there's a systematic community building thing going on around these DIY bike shops, and it's around the transfer of technological knowledge. It's around using the waste stream of wasted parts and broken bicycles that are endlessly thrown away on the curb by Americans who just think of them as toys and junk. And there's all these people who recognize, no, this is a huge transportation infrastructure at our disposal, really. It's being disposed of, but let's take it out of that stream, and instead of putting it in the landfill, let's reuse these things. And you have uh, at least one or more of these bike shops have emerged in almost every city in the United States in the last 10 years, mostly run by volunteers. There's very few people even getting wages out of these things, although one of their dramas is that as they succeed and they become more stable over time, then the, the normal problems of a small business begin to beset them with you know, rent and wages and so on. But uh, in any case, the bicycling movement's been one of the more interesting areas of expression of this DIY impulse. And the DIY, you know, obviously it can be reduced to this simple action of just fixing it yourself or doing your own gardening or what have you. But the deeper impulse of DIY is the refusal of corporate and governmental expertise and saying that they're, what they tell us is not necessarily true at all. In fact, it's very often blatantly false. So one of the interesting examples of this going back in our recent history is the women's health movement. Because women got together and started organizing themselves for their own health when they realized that main, you know, normal mainstream medicine was just not going to meet their needs. And so now you have all these women's health clinics all over the country. This goes back to the 60s and 70s. You know, the rise of the legal right to abortion, the self-care around you know, reproductive health. All these things are phenomena of a DIY movement of women for their own health care. Another great example which we now have to reinvent is the anti-nuclear movement. The nuclear was presented to everybody as though it was a fait accompli and there was no way around it and it was the obvious solution for all of our problems. Now they're talking that way again, but there's a whole lot of us out here, millions of us who know better and who spent a lot of time in the 1970s finding out that nuclear was a ridiculous way of boiling water and there's a lot more efficient ways of, of producing the energy needs that we have before us. And so nuclear you know, becomes a disaster on a bunch of different levels. And the kind of DIY sensibility that informed that was partly because we taught ourselves and we had all these study groups and affinity groups and direct action groups and so on that really developed the knowledge of what the real issues were around energy production and energy consumption for that matter. But then also a number of people dropped out of the professional world. And we have this anti-professionalism phenomenon, which there, you can find in every field, where people who are skilled and well-trained join the, join the opposition and realize that by going out and just keeping their mouth shut and doing their job and working for capital, they're actually causing many more problems than they can possibly justify to themselves. And instead, they take that time and technological expertise and contribute it to, to social movements who are in opposition to the agenda being presented from on high. So these are kind of examples of a DIY. We just had this in the Bay Area. They were going to spray the whole area for brown apple moths. An incredible social movement erupted in less than the last three months, and, and that they've just announced that they're not going to spray. And it's because so many people were up in arms about it and, and pushing back against it, even though they claimed it was totally safe. But people figured out that it wasn't. So this kind of DIY impulse, I think, is a really important part of our lives that we have to honor and expand. Talking with Chris Carlson, he is author of the new book, Nowtopia. And uh, in addition to your book, do you have a website people can go to? Yeah, my website. I have one under my name, which leads to everything else. It's chriscarlson.com, and Carlson spelled with two S's. There's also nowtopia.org, and uh, you can get the book at akpress.org. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us this Thanks morning. Thanks very much. Hope to see you all at the bookstores.